Good evening and welcome to Chicago Founder Stories here at 1871, Chicago's digital startup hub. We have with us tonight uh, the co-founder of FeedBurner and the current CTO and co-founder of BrightTag, uh, Eric Lund. Eric, great to have you with us. Well, thank you. It's an it's, uh, honor to be here, really. It's exciting. It's, uh, this will be one of the more interesting uh, stories, and I think it's one of the stories that is uh, somewhat less known. We met through Dodd Kitlaus, who was a, a great founder. A neighbor and, of mine. Yes, yep. your neighborhood is doing well. <laughs> um, founder of Siri, and uh, Eric has a great story, so this will be a fun one for everybody. Um, let's, let's go back to FeedBurner, which is obviously your most successful exit to date. Um, I know you don't disclose it, but I understand it was sold to Google for around $100 million and a great success story for Chicago uh, very early on in the tech renaissance here. But for those who may not have been familiar, a little younger in the crowd, mm -hmm. what does FeedBurner do? What did, what did FeedBurner do when you guys created it? So FeedBurner uh, is, is really a, uh, a company to help people and companies syndicate their, their content. So, this is, so we started working on FeedBurner in 2003. And there was this emerging kind of uh, standard or trend called RSS which is a, a, a way to actually syndicate information. And this was kind of a, this is kind of a geeky, bleeding edge kind of thing, but we, we had noticed that there is, was an increased usage of, of this particular form of content syndication. And uh, there, there were all these publishers, major media publishers, bloggers, all these kinds of things that uh, really didn't realize that they had this, this way to, to syndicate information. And so at Feedburner we're like, hmm, well, there, there are these people that are consuming it. The, the, the publishers don't even know that they're really publishing it. Let's provide a set of services to those publishers uh, to actually measure what kind of traffic there is and what kind of subscriber base you have through this means. And then once they realize, oh my goodness, I have no idea there are this, this many people that are consuming my content in a, and they're not coming to my webpage and seeing my ads, uh, we, we, we let them know that. And then we were able to then offer them a monetization strategy on those feeds. Got it, interesting. So I know you were the leader in uh, RSS feeds and, and the services around it. Um, but you've been a founder a whole no a number of times. We'll talk about all of them mm -hmm. tonight. It's uh, interesting how many times you've done it. Successful CTO, serial founder uh, with great success. Were you always going to be an entrepreneur, or always going to be in technology? You grew up in the suburbs here. What? Would, would people have known you then say, well, he was definitely going to be a guy involved in technology or, or definitely? I think so, yeah. So um, I grew, grew up in, in Barrington in the northwest suburbs, and, uh, and that's where I, where I live now, kind of moved back to the, to the old hood. And uh, it, was, it was, I've always, since, yeah, you know, I'm going to date myself a little bit, but, uh, you know, since the, we have a, a couple of teletype uh, kind of terminals at our school. Uh, so this is like 19... Uh, 79, 80, uh, so started to get involved into to kind of playing around with those things. And then uh, during fifth grade, I uh, started a, like a little lawnmower business kind of thing to, to do a bunch of... Well, that's bugs. entrepreneurial, but, but I have a sense that you <laughs> took this a different direction. By the way, Chris Gladwin talked about how he had the first sort of serial paper route distribution network. Yeah, yeah. It tells you how Chris works, but you... No, this was just for the money. This just was for the money. It was just right. for the money because I, had to, I wanted to save up for a computer camp computer after my camp. fifth grade. Uh, so there was a computer camp out in Santa Barbara, California, then, and so I raised the money. So Some I people go to astronaut camp. camp, you went to computer yeah, camp. That's yeah. cool. How they had cutting-edge Apple IIs and Atari 800s out there to, <laughs> to, to, to learn about assembly. and It'd be and, a museum. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, that's it. How was computer camp? Was it worth it? It was, uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. It, it was one of the things that, uh, and so I've always had this this affinity towards towards technology. Um, and I guess the uh, I don't I don't know where the, the entrepreneurship came from. Um, my dad has always uh, uh, been really an entrepreneur and kind of inspiration in, in, in that way as well. So I guess cool. it rubbed off. Well, that's great. So um, so you go to high school um, in Barrington. Yep. And uh, and then you went to Princeton. Yep. Um, well. Pursuing, I mean, you don't think of Princeton necessarily, you think it as one of the great universities in the world, but not necessarily as a, um, a place, well, certainly Jeff Bezos went there. Mm -hmm. You don't think of it as kind of a hardcore tech place in the same way that MIT is or mm -hmm. something. Um, talk about that experience and what you did and how that shaped kind of your, your path. Well, it was, it was. Uh, you certainly went the well-rounded route. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, it, it basically came down to senior year, uh, like after after my, my junior year, I don't, I don't know how, my parents let me do this, but me and three other guys, we like piled into a van in the, in the summer after junior year and just went out east and, and started visiting 
uh, a, a whole bunch of different colleges, a lot of the IVs and things like that. And I came back from that experience saying, I, I want Princeton is awesome. I want to I want to go there. Of, of of all the ones that I saw, the the, the campus was beautiful. It just you know it spoke to me in some way. Uh, so but so I I, I uh, applied to two schools uh, my senior year. It was Princeton and U of I. Because uh, U of I, you know, obviously with just their... Just like the guy in Risky Business, University of uh, Illinois. Yeah, I'm, you, there you go. I'm, I'm Joel. Yeah. You're Joel. That's um, nice. I like it. Uh, so, it's, uh, so, I mean, obviously with, with uh, at that, you know, U of I has always had a super strong engineering, especially computer science program. Sure. I mean, this is this was at the time. Well, you would have been, been like with Andreessen. Yeah, you would have been right time. in that. that yeah, so... Um, so it was, it, was, it was really tempting, and then I knew my then-girlfriend at that time was going to be going to U of I in the next year. Um, so there was a, it was pretty tough, but I, I ended up making the decision to go well, out Princeton's to Princeton. Princeton's great, of course. Now, if you'd gone to University of Illinois, I'd be interviewing you about how you founded Netscape, but, you know, <laughs> I still like speedrunners. Okay. Yeah. It's, uh, no, so it's, you, you go there, and Princeton's a fantastic place, but um, what did you pursue? Did you, did you pursue computer science? Did you, uh, what was... What was your focus, and how did that focus lead you into a career path? Yeah, uh, so in high school, it was always about, uh, I, I really like the sciences and, and, and math and physics. So I'm like, I got to do something with, I got to do something with physics. Uh, and so I, I actually ended up going into a program called engineering physics at, mm. uh, at, at Princeton, which was, you know, first semester, this is, this is great. It's like, I, you know, AP physics really prepared me well, and I get all this kind of stuff, and I moved into some kind of a, Electrodynamic stuff, it's, it's still cool. Um, and then I hit quantum, uh, quantum mechanics. And, and, and like, you were over brain, my head a little while ago. My brain didn't, could, not, could not comprehend quantum mechanics. So once I hit that, that, that uh, school and I saw around me all these people that understood and I knew I didn't, uh, that's when I switched over to, to full mechanical engineering. Um, and then, uh, so I did mechanical engineering, but I was always doing any excuse to be on computers. This is really interesting. How many of you have been to Founder Stories this year in 2014? So it's interesting. This is the third founder we've had um, who's a mechanical engineer. Um, Godard Abel, founder of Big Machines, mechanical engineer, undergrad and grad from MIT. Chris Gladwin, mechanical engineer at MIT, um, mechanical engineer at Princeton. It's interesting to see, you, you think the stereotype of being yeah. in, in computer science, but obviously mech has so, been a great path into this as well. So. Don't ask me how a car engine works or anything because I, I'm pretty sure I knew at one point because I there was something on that but but have no idea. So I ended up uh, at, at Princeton. You do a senior thesis or independent work, and um, I did mine. Uh, basically, I, I found my way into a, a, a grad lab that was uh, doing all sorts of computer visualization. So they were using cutting edge silicon graphics machines wow, that's cool. uh, in, the, in the early 90s. So. I ended up getting a certificate in applied computational mathematics, and I did my, my senior work on basically uh, com computational fluid dynamics and the visualization of that. So I got to play around with all these great like okay. computer graphics and, and things like that. So I knew coming out of that, it's like kind of in retrospect, it's like I should have done CS, but but found a, you know you can always worm your way into to the it, right place. Well, obviously that seemed to hold you back at all. So <laughs> you're uh, so you get out of Princeton and. Um, where did you go next, and, and why? Came came back to back to Chicago and uh, um, and went with uh, Anderson Consulting, which is is now Accenture, and uh, so the you know basically kind of classic uh, consulting route. Uh, I wanted to be back in the city. I heard they did computer stuff. Uh, <laughs> it sounded interesting, so uh, I, I came back. And, and did you ever think about moving to the Valley or anyplace else? You know, in uh, you know ninety two. The valley was still like that's where Atari used to be, and all that right. kind of. So we're we're still in the glove before Netscape, um, before really the you know those those marquee names really kind of showed up there. I mean, you, certainly you had Sun, you had HP, uh, and you had a so number of those. But Oracle, yeah, SGI, but, yeah. Yep. Um, interesting. So you go to work. So how was it working at Anderson Consulting? Well, I again, I kind of. I could, I could just chart my, my, my progress through a series of, of, of kind of lucky events because I, didn't, I ended up uh, finding there was this internal kind of advanced technology project uh, at Anderson Consulting. It was called Project Eagle. And uh, so I wasn't on the, uh, you know, the, the classic, hey, you're right out of school and, and what basically the, the idea is they'll, normally is they would, they would find a client, staff you, put you on the bus, and you'd go out to some client wherever that would be and you would work on that. Well, um, 
I managed to get on this kind of internal technology project. And so basically it was a, a, there was a group of probably about 80 people that ended up peaking at, basically creating the next kind of this reusable technology that uh, this set of frameworks that could be leveraged across the whole firm. Uh, so, and, and we were using the, it was all done in small talk uh, back then. So uh, it ended up being a, a fantastic group when I made some really important connections at that time. So it's an interesting group, was it, um, and did people, I know sometimes people went on and off of clients. Is this something people stayed on longer? Was yeah. It, how long? Yeah, so this was, this was uh, basically, I was there for my entire, um, pretty much my entire four-year career wow. was all in this group. It was, so oh. it, was an, it was an internal group or, or the, a cost center, uh, essentially, because um, we weren't able to build the clients for it, but the idea was hopefully that we'd develop something leverageable that other people could leverage. So you're, you're in this group and you make some, you, you establish some lifelong relationships and future partners there. Talk yeah. a little bit about who this lineup of future uh, uh, partners yeah, is. Yeah, well, I, I ended up, all the, all the co-founders of, of, of FeedBurner, and actually some, some companies before that, uh, we all met at Anderson. So this is, again, circa 94, 95. And um, uh, so there was uh, uh, myself, uh, uh, another co-founder, uh, Dick Costello, um, who's, who's now the CEO of, of Twitter. Um, then there's uh, Steve Olakowski, uh, who, who still lives in the area and uh, um, uh, is, was awesome coder and, and great operations and business uh, dev guy. And then uh, Matt Shobe, uh, who was really in charge of user experience and user interface uh, and, and kind of a front end, front end development there. So we all, we all happened to, to kind of meet in, in Anderson Consulting and then we, you know, dissipated a little bit but then reconnected eventually. So you and Dick, now this is, those of you who don't know, Dick was also, I think, doing Second City at the time? He was doing some Second City. Um, he, he, he thought he, he had a uh, potential career in comedy. So he was doing some Second City. While he was at Anderson, he was actually uh, up at the Annoyance Theater doing a bunch of improv. So he, he was an uh, improv guy. How funny is he? He's a funny guy. Yeah. He's a very it's, funny uh, guy. I've, you know, I've seen him, I've seen him interviewed. It seems like he's got some. Uh, well, it's, it's, you know what, it's, it's more important. Uh, it's not so much the funny, but how quick he can be on his feet. So, you know, mm -hmm. you're, you're on a CNBC and you've got Kramer tossing any questions at you. You got to be able to be really yeah, right. quick on your feet. That's a, that's a real talent. So you and Dick leave Anderson Consulting in uh, 96. Yeah. And uh, with, a, am sure, a big grand vision, right? We, What's your we, big grand vision? Hey, because you guys have both gone on to do great things. So what? Hey, there's this thing, the web that's happening. You know, there, I hear there's a there's a web, and, and we'd actually uh, kind of pitched this at, at Anderson because uh, uh, Java had just come out. So again, '96 Java, and and we were still doing kind of fat clients, and and we pitched to kind of the management there. Actually, like, for those who aren't technical, explain what a fat client. Fat is. client is. We'll send you a floppy disk, and you install it on your computer, and then maybe you talk to our servers. Maybe it's all there, but. We, we saw with the, when, when Netscape IPO'd and we started to, to, to see the, the W, the, the, gosh, what was it, the cyber, uh, cyberspace, right? So when cyberspace was, was, was taking off, uh, that we're, uh, so Dick and I basically had pitched to, to some of the management, it's like, hey, we should really invest in this and think about getting rid of kind of our thick client strategy and, and moving towards the web. And they were like, eh, that, that, that's great, we've got our, we've got our plans, so uh, we ended up, uh, leaving and, and starting a, a company called Burning Door Networked Media. Uh, that was, it was just a web consulting shop. We were just, we hung our shingle hoping to do websites for, for different companies. How many of you saw Jason Fried when he was here in March? Anybody here for Jason Fried? Mm -hmm. So it's interesting, that's how Jason, you know, Jason, they were doing oh, yeah. web design consulting right around the same time probably. Yeah, yeah, yep, exactly. Um, interesting, so, and so you start that, you're doing consulting, um, but you're not a product company yet. And oh no, open. gosh no. I mean, we had maybe we would, we back then, you know, there really weren't a whole lot of frameworks for for doing websites, dynamic websites. We were really cutting edge, so it was, uh, you know, Perl doing CGI and, and things like that. There was no, there were no repos out there or GitHub there. You could just pull stuff down. It was it was just hack upon hack basically to get any kind of dynamic website up. So you get out and you pitch. How do you? How's your? How, what, who's your first big client? First big client. Uh, you know, it was uh, Square D. So Square D uh, electronics uh, distribution and uh, electricity distribution equipment. And you know, as, as you saw from that point on, they, they're like, hey, we need a website. Get us a website. And, and uh, we had managed to, to partner ourselves since it was just uh, you know, two or three of us. Um, 
we managed to partner with uh, Closer Look, which is another company here in Chicago. And they had a much larger team with project management and creatives and things like that. So we did the technical heavy lifting and they did the, basically all the, a lot of the other kind of website-y kinds of things. So that was, that was a kind of, actually when you look back, that was kind of our big and, and pretty much only client. <laughs> yeah. So, but the company gets sold fairly quickly. Oh yeah, we so we so now now we're talking uh, late '96, early '97, and there was there was some interest, there was some acquisition interest in Burning Door Network Media because, uh, you know, because apparently we were doing web stuff. So there were um, a couple of guys that uh, were at at, at uh, Kellogg School at Northwestern. Uh, one was a dean at the time, another one had been a, a recent a recent student there, and they had an idea. You know, this is the the, the classic. Uh, um, you know, basically some ideas that need some technical co-founders. And, and, and we, they, they somehow had found us and identified that we might, we could be potentially the technical co-founders. So They're at the pretty time, smart on that one. Well, they, they, so, so it, it's, it's so funny looking back because it was like, uh, you, you know, we were all excited. It's like, oh my gosh, someone's going to acquire us. You know, and it's, it's, it's two people, uh, you know, two people with, with uh, well, a little bit of website. capital, you know, and, 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 uh, and, and some interest in, and so really when you look back, it's like, you know, they were just hiring us and, you know, the acquisition was essentially a signing bonus. So you were like, <laughs> you were like one of the first aqua hires? That's right, that's right. So um, for no actual technology, it was just, it was just the people, so. And how'd that go? <laughs> it actually, um, it actually went. So the, the name of the company at this time was uh, called DKA. Uh, digital knowledge assets kind of rolls right off the tongue, um, and uh, the 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 purpose of this company was to do essentially enterprise blogging and knowledge management. Hmm. So take all the great things about blogging, which was just happening at the time. So we were kind of contemporaries of of, of Evan Williams uh, at the time, who, who was developing Blogger, uh, and. Uh, all the great, all the great dynamics of, of a consumer-facing service, which is you know, virality and, and and getting it out there, but pair that with with enterprise software sales and internal facing and and something exciting like internal knowledge management. So it was actually some really cool technology, but uh, uh, not the biggest uh, uh, market opportunity. Yeah, that would be hard. To <laughs> it's a long time until uh, uh, Yammer came along. Uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, you know, and it was still like, again, kind of worst of both worlds. It was a web-based solution, but you had to install it on your web servers, right? <laughs> so there was no, there is no Amazon Cloud. There's nothing like that. There's, here's, here's your Netscape, uh, you know, Constellation server on a CD. You install it, and then here's our CD that you install on the servers right next to it. So, um, you know, these are early days. So you get out there, and uh, how does that end up? Um, so we actually developed that for for a couple of years. Uh, there were a couple a couple uh, nice clients. There were you know like uh, 3Com at the time, and uh, there were a couple of others. But uh, ultimately, there was there there was just no real traction. Probably five or six actual clients. Um, so after after a couple of years, we um, you know at this time now those those four people those three other people that I'd met at, at Anderson were now all working. We kind of brought them all in. At, at, they were all working at DKA. So. The four of us decided to, after a couple of years, that kind of saw the writing on the wall. So we decided to leave and, and form our own company. And what was what was this one? What was the next one? The next one was Burning Door Network Media. So <laughs> Burning Door Two. Yeah, Burning Door Two. So right. uh, we we, we so why, so, it. So and, and why? This is I mean you did it the first time because you were trying to figure out what to do. Yeah. What it was a way to get in. Yeah. Um, what made you take that path again? I think we still have the domain name. Uh, that's, that's pretty much it. Still have the domain name and. Uh, uh, and the idea was, hey, there are some, uh, you know, we had we had some ideas for for product and other technology, uh, but you know, so what, what what we thought we'd do is we'd actually go and do some more consulting uh, for, at, at Burning Door and use that to fund basically development of different product ideas, kind of spike on different kinds of ideas, and then as something kind of so pay the pay the bills with consulting yeah. and then sort of use the use your other time to. Work on product. Exactly, exactly, and uh, um, th th which is a kind model a more we actually repeated later. Kind of a more intentional version of what they did at Thirty Seven Six. Actually, I, you know, Jason and his team, I think, were an inspiration. Pardon me. At the time, um, it was the that that same idea where you can um, you can actually use that that funds to, to help with with that product development. Got it. And so, um, talk about that. You know, how many products did you try and create? Well, we, we, we tried a couple, but then we, we actually landed on one fairly quickly. It was only after a couple months. 
uh, we, we started creating uh, a, a consumer-facing software service, uh, and it was called Spyomit. So spyomit.com. And the idea behind a spy, it's actually kind of similar to like a Google Alerts or some other kind of alerting engine where you would create these spies and you would say things like, you know, let me know when there's a, a powder at, uh, you know, more than six inches of powder at Aspen last night, or when my name is mentioned somewhere on the web, the Vanity Spy was a big, most obviously the most popular spy, or when my stock portfolio at Morningstar uh, is up by more than 2% in a day. So you would set up all these spies, and then it would notify you via a, the they email. they spiders or what? There was a lot of crawling uh, involved where we would, you would set up these spies and you would say exactly how do you get the information, how do you process the information and do the change detection um, in that. So, um, and it would notify you via email, instant messenger, that well, AOL instant messenger or MSN messenger or Yahoo messenger. Uh, there really wasn't so much SMS at the time. But, uh, but it was actually, a, it was a fun little service that I, I, I kind of look today at, at some of the alerting things. It's like, oh man, spy on, that would have that killed today. Um, so that, yeah, that was a, it was so a that, service. that kind of that took off, right? It, it did. It, it, it ended up being, uh, one of the, uh, Yahoo's top sites in, I think it was, it was 98 or 99, something like that. And so, uh, we, uh, so we were like, all right, let's, we think this thing's going to be a big deal. Let's, let's go ahead and, and, and build this out as a, as a product and as a company. So we, we took the trek out to, to Sand Hill Road and started you know, pitching our idea um, to different venture capitalists out there. And uh, did you end up raising money? Uh, we had a few term sheets. We were just about to uh, actually uh, uh, close on a, on a couple of them. And, uh, and then we got, we got a call from, from someone in Canada. It was actually, they, they called and they said, we thought they kept saying, we're 24-7 we're 20, media. We thought it was some local company of trying to get us to, to, to like pitch ad services or something like that. But it ended up being a company called 724 Solutions which was a Canadian telecom company uh, that provided banking services to different banks. Uh, and uh, basically, after, after hanging up on them like three times, they finally called back and said, no, we want your company. Then they had to uh, basically, and, and then that caused a, a few of us to like, what, what are you talking about? And so uh, they had wanted the, the technology to actually do kind of power banking alerts, a lot like what you see with Chase today, like let me know am I checking a withdrawal is this or checking account drops below that or something like that. And so you, uh, how long has the company, you have the company for it sells? Um, I think it was probably, it was a little over a year I think, probably wow. 14, 14 months maybe. You guys turn these things fast. <laughs> um, and so what, what do you end up selling it for? Oh, so here we are in uh, September. September of 2000, so peak bubble, right? And so uh, we ended up selling for $54 million. Sounds pretty, pretty good. Pretty much all stock. Um, <laughs> all of a very and how, how big a lockout? stock. Uh, with, you know, uh, basically a one-year lockout um, and non, pretty much a non-hedgeable position. Um, so, uh, yeah, we ended up seeing that, 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 uh, that stock was riding at about. You guys learned a lot about selling your company along the way. And we how have not to made get it. so many mistakes along the way, and we learn. Uh, so you as sold we go your first along. company; it was really an aqua hire. Yep. The second company you sell for stock that ended up being worth. Uh, pretty much, uh, you know, uh, nickels on the dollar uh, a year later. About fifty-two million dollars less than you. Yeah, yeah, it was a, it was it was a bit of a deflation. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, but on paper. Yeah, it was huge. Man, right? we were we were flying high. You get the right press release, yeah, you look yeah. awesome. Oh, we, we felt we felt we felt like kings of the world. Yeah, I'm you're not living in Barrington yeah. on that. <laughs> so, um, so the fifty-four million goes to almost nothing. Pretty much, uh, substantially less. There was a small cash component, thank God, um, uh, for that for that initial uh, uh, deal. Yeah. All right. So, um, so fifty-four million to zero, but you had a company that had traction. What happened to the yep. product? Um, product ended up uh, as as the you know 724 solutions as a whole uh, as as the as the stock price so did, so did the company go kind of ended, ended up uh, fizzling down quite a bit big downsizing the, the whole bit so we had we had our, our, our they were based in Toronto uh, Canada but we had our, our Chicago office here and you know we'd built that up to about 40 people or so but uh, again after after a couple of years it was uh, it was time to move on okay so you you learn about how not to sell the second time, yeah. but you've, you've got really great traction. Yeah. Um, so 
now what's the next big idea? Can you guess? Burning Door Networked Media 3? Burning Door 3. Same four of us. You guys uh, are really creative with the names. We had to make sure we had to keep renewing that domain name because uh, we know we were going to keep going back to it All uh, right. that well. So well, Let me uh, guess. You did can you consulting. Imagine, can you imagine what our model was? Okay. Yes. I'm thinking you may have done some web <laughs> consulting and used that money to build products. Exactly. Uh, so, you know, it had worked before, so <laughs> like I've seen we decided movie. to try to do that again. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, that part yeah. of your formula seems to work. It's the selling you part. You know, it was, it was the, uh, yeah, so we, again, lessons learned. Maybe, maybe we can make different mistakes the next time. <laughs> okay, so you go out, do you have one big idea, or are you going out trying a bunch of different things? Actually, in this case, uh, it, it took a little longer to, to kind of to zero in on the, on the idea of, that, of what eventually became Feedburner. And, and so uh, before you talk about how you got there, yeah. What was the worst idea Burning Door Media, worst product idea Burning Door Media came up with? Oh, man. Um, Makes everybody else feel better about when they do something that's not great, because you guys have been incredibly successful. Um, well, it wasn't a, uh, there, there were, it wasn't a bad idea. It just, it, it just, it didn't what? match up with, with our particular talent. So it, it sounded, it sounded great. Like, um, uh, one idea was, okay, so again, this is circa 2003, and there were, uh, Sony Ericsson had just come out with the, the, the Ericsson communicator, which was kind of a, a smartphone that mm -hmm. ran the Symbian OS. Uh, and, uh, and so um, Steve, uh, one of the, the, the co-founders, uh, had, had come up with this idea for, uh, to do mobile medical imaging. So you're a radiologist and you are going to, you know, so MRIs are taking or, or uh, x-rays are taking and and you're sitting at your son's ball game and you want to be able to review them without having to go into the office and look at the x-rays. So they would basically like beam up to you. Idea, all that. Yeah. It was a, a very clever idea uh, and a good idea. It just didn't happen to align with our particular strengths. None of us actually had any, any experience in, in that domain. Uh, it was still really early for high resolution images to go over those, those kind of networks and things like that. So it was a little bit uh, ahead of its time and uh, we just we just didn't have the right skill set for it. Got it. Well, you're not gonna make me feel that much better about my bad product ideas in the past. But, well, <laughs> um, all right. So feed burner. Where's the idea come from? Um, so feed burner uh, again is 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 just kind of looking. We're we're, we're just kind of looking for trends, looking for opportunities. Um, and and it happened to be that we started actually using RSS and actually reading, and it was kind of a pain. There were all these readers out there. There were all sorts of these different feed formats. Uh, so this reader could read this website, but this other one could read a different one because they talked slightly different protocols. So it was, a lot of it was born out of, of, of looking at the opportunity, but then actually experiencing it, actually experiencing the pain of, of <coughs> trying to consume content during this channel. So, so we thought, well, what if we could kind of sit in the middle and offer our services so that uh, no matter what the feed format is that the, they're publishing uh, or what feed format is that all these readers are doing, we could sit in the middle <coughs> and kind of negotiate and arbitrate those and, and convert the formats if we need to. Mm -hmm. Now, oh, and if we're in there, what other things can we do? Well, then we can provide services to all these publishers to actually tell them how many subscribers they have and, and, and do some other things like that. So we're like, let's call it feed management. And so. Uh, in late 2003, we started development on that. Um, and so how long does that take to get traction? Well, we uh, ended up kind of doing our, our, I think we called it our pre-alpha launch at South by Southwest in 2004. Oh, cool. Uh, so we're down in That's Austin. That's pretty quick. And, yeah, so, you know, it was it was a good good four, uh, four or five months of, of development before we felt, you know, that it was okay to show the So work. how was it to launch a product at South by Southwest back in those days? It was, uh, you know, it was great. It was, it's a totally, a totally different deal, right? It was, it was much smaller, uh, and it was more of a uh, community that you, you kind of knew. So, uh, so it was, it was, uh, it was actually great. Talked to you know a number of of bloggers down there. There were some blogging networks, uh, and and got to talk to them and tell them about the opportunities of of what they could do. You should totally use Feedburner, and and you know it was, but for a while it was it was pretty slow growth. It was just kind of word of mouth kind of growth uh, for the use of the service. And um, so where did the where did the traction or where did the inflection point start to come in? Well, then then uh, in later in 2004, uh, Google did us a huge favor. 
Uh, and, and Google had acquired the, the company Blogger. So this is Ev Williams' um, company. Uh, and, and Blogger was all about self-publishing. So you, if you had a blog, they invented the word, right? If a blog, uh, you were, you were self-publishing. It was hosted either on Blogspot, which is hosted, or on your own servers. And as part of that, you would uh, just kind of as a side effect, you had a feed. You had an RSS feed that, that came along with that. And it turned out that that was a very popular way that, that uh, people consumed the information. Instead of having to remember in the morning, oh, I'll check out this blog, this blog, this blog, this blog, and, and kind of doing your morning walk, you would instead subscribe to those feeds, look in your feed reader and say, oh, here are the things that have new posts, you know, and, and, and just be able to efficiently kind of run through that. Uh, well, so RSS was the dominant feed format, and then in uh, mid-2004, they just decided, you know what, we're gonna use a different format. We're gonna use this new format called Atom, which was incompatible with, with RSS. And we're just gonna, that's gonna be the feed format that we <coughs> choose. And so all of a sudden they start publishing this new feed format. None of the existing readers could, could read it unless you went through FeedBurner. So now all these publishers that had done all their feeds, they're like, man, no one's, you know, I lost all my subscribers, what's happening? Oh, okay. It's because all these things don't read the so feed. So, what, what could, you, what did you do that allowed that? What was the? Speed? So, as long as you burned your feed with FeedBurner, uh, we were the proxy in the middle. So, we managed your feed for you, and we could detect that. Oh, the the, the reader that they're using doesn't understand this format. So, we'll on the fly translate it to the format that it will understand. Got it. So, it's like basically like on the fly transcoding. If you were to think about music formats or something like that. Um, so that was. And, how, so, and, and Google was good with that. Well, I don't, I don't, they, they didn't really understand. I, I, I had been friends with, with uh, Evan for a while and, and kind of knew it and, and uh, we had talked a little bit about it and, and it was like, oh, dude, you, you helped us out so much <laughs> uh, by doing this because, so at that point we were able to tra track our growth and the number of people when, when they made that change that, that ended up using FeedBurner, it just, you know, totally ramped up. So talk for a minute, I think this is an interesting one. So Evan Williams, everybody know who Evan Williams is? So Evan Williams is the, was the founder of Blogger. He was also the founder of Odeo and the co-founder of Twitter, yeah. um, which is kind of serendipitous because he, Dick, then your partner and co-founder, uh, went to go be the yeah. COO there when Evan was the CEO. Yep. Yep. And then succeeded him as the CEO. So yep. there's a really interesting storyline here of Blogger and FeedBurner yeah. and then Odeo and FeedBurner and then yeah. Google and he'd been at Google before, and then Twitter, and then Dick going to Twitter, and now Dick running Twitter. Yeah. I don't think that's a story that's particularly well known. I think people just assume that. Um, well, talk yeah. a little bit about that journey of the companies and people being in parallel. There's, it's actually, it, it, is, it is interesting when you think about, uh, there, were, there were some events that happened in, the, in those two different timelines that reinforced each other, and some that were almost mirror positions of each other. Right. So, for example, uh, this this uh, blogger changing feed formats, you know, that was fine for them. That ended up giving a huge boost to to, to feed burner in terms of that. And then fast forward a little bit, and uh, <coughs> um, uh, Ev leaves and, and starts Odeo, which is a podcasting company. So this is uh, they're going to be. So this is uh, you know this is podcasting because there were iPods and and now so this was a way to democratize broadcasting. So you could do these radio shows without having any airwaves and you could listen to them on your iPod. Um, so they start Odeo as a, as a uh, way to manage How many people here have read the book Hatching Twitter? Anybody here read the book Hatching Twitter? If you haven't, it's a really it's interesting a read, a fascinating read. It really tells the whole story and the, the part that Eric's talking about now is really interesting because uh, if you remember podcasting was starting to get a lot of talk and early yep. adopter talk. And then one day, Apple iTunes made podcasting free. Yeah, and yeah. As part of the they, iTunes platform, they basically so when Apple built in uh, podcasting support into iTunes, it kind of decimated uh, Odeo's business model because now it's just part of this client that everyone is downloading. But on the flip side, since guess guess what's behind podcasts? The format behind podcasts is RSS. So and FeedBurner had a service where anyone, as long as you you know point us at your audio files, we'll go ahead and create the appropriate format, the file format, for you to actually list yourself on iTunes and to be able to find that. So while that decimated audio, that was our second inflection point at FeedBurner huh. once they did that because now we were the tool for, for podcasting and, and actually oh, publishing your podcast. So they commoditized that business, but it helped you. 
Absolutely, yeah. Huh, interesting. Um, and then what happens at Odeo, of course, is they have a project that turned into Twitter. Yeah. And Twitter ends up becoming hatched out of Odeo. Um, and then the story talks a lot about Twitter. It's a fascinating book. Well, and, 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 and then taking that further then, so now, so, so uh, you know, you, you could basically look at, at uh, and maybe I'm jumping ahead a little no, bit. No, go ahead. But uh, now, so RSS and, and as a client-facing technology, which is reading, reading all these feeds and stuff like that, basically as Twitter and Facebook uh, popularize their means of, of subscribing and following, things like that, and, and finding this river of news, that eats into the RSS market share. And now RSS as a client-facing actual technology starts to decline as, as Twitter you know, as the use of Twitter increases. So it was basically, basically we kept lobbing, you know, customers and all that stuff back and forth. And of course the story ends by Dick Costello, the co-founder of Feedburner, becoming the CEO of Twitter and yep. then later the CEO of Twitter, yep. uh, taking over from Evan Williams, who you've exactly. known since the blogger days. I mean, yep. it's, it's an amazing, um, it's an amazingly interconnected story yeah. Yeah. that I think is really, most people outside of this room haven't heard, you're, you're probably among the first to really hear how that all came about. A lot of people think, you know, Dick was brought in as a hired gun CEO. They don't understand the oh, no, history of all the people. Long history. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great story, and I think yeah. really misunderstood. Yeah. Um, and we'll talk more about that. So, talk about uh, two things. One, you talk, you you mentioned how Feedburner was, um, or the RSS world was really impacted by all this broadcast and the way yeah. information was being uh, distributed. When did you sell relative to that commoditization coming in? I think we, when did we sell to, to Google? Yeah. We, we sold at peak RSS. <laughs> 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 that, was, that was actually So you got a lot better if you sold some Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, 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 we learned a couple of things. I mean, but that's only in retrospect. That's, that's being a little bit of a Monday morning quarterback. Um, at the time of the sale, uh, you know, <coughs> this, is, this is peak RSS, and we, we thought that the trend would continue upwards. And, uh, you know, the big reason for uh, that we thought Google was such a, a great acquirer for our technology is that we had built out basically AdSense for feeds. So a means to actually monetize uh, those syndicated feeds for those publishers that wanted to. And we had been building out our own ad network at, at FeedBurner, and we had a big supply problem, a lot more demand than we had supplies. So it made sense to be able to marry that with, with Google's ad inventory and for them to be able to leverage our publisher relationships uh, to do all that. So, and, and we thought like, man, this is, gonna, this is gonna take over the world. But in retrospect, it was pretty much peak RSS. <laughs> um, two things I wanna talk about on that one. One is, um, uh, first of all, having sold before, did you take cash or stock this time? Well, it, <laughs> we're talking about Google. <laughs> I know, it would have turned out great for you to kept the stock. <laughs> hey, it's, oh, there's always more optionality with cash. There you go. Well, <laughs> Google seems to have done all right since yeah, 2007. Think, yeah, <laughs> if, you, if, you, if, you, if you chart that out, it'd be, it'd be all right there. Uh, okay, so good out, great outcome, fantastic outcome fantastic for outcome. Chicago and for yeah. you guys. But I want to go back before we go into the next chapter, which I'm sure is Burning Door Media 4 or, or 5. <laughs> but, um, and that is, <clears throat> we talk a lot about business models. Um, you and I talked a little bit about, uh, as we were preparing for this, we talked a little bit about... Um, where your business model was relative to your adoption. Your adoption was quite a bit ahead of mm -hmm. the business model side yeah. of it. Talk a little bit about where you were in the business model uh, perspective um, and why that mattered or didn't matter. Yeah, yeah. Again, uh, at the time of... Uh, Pri prior to the sale of Google. Yeah, so at the time though, so so this is... Well, right, right prior to that, so this is early 2007, and, you know, we were building out the ad network, we were building that out. We thought, you know, we're... Our potential is, is 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 quite a bit high. We thought we were in the you know second inning of a nine inning game, and and that there there was we had all sorts of room to grow. We just needed um you know the different partnerships for different ad networks, and we had a number of those working. Uh, Steve had been working on a number of those partnerships. Uh, so uh, what we 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 really thought we weren't in no way, shape, or form looking for for an exit. We thought well, we're going to build this thing and, and we're going to make it uh, make it sing. So. Um. And so what made you sell? Well, it, it, it really was uh, at, at, at first really looking at, well, they're actually the solution to a lot of the problems that we're having, which was uh, 
understanding understanding what that means to do to do internet marketing to do uh, the online marketing they have the experience with with AdSense and search search oriented feeds um, or search oriented ads and for for different kind of display networks and, and things like that so we really thought oh man finally we can get the inventory that we needed to satisfy all the demand of all the publishers that wanted to advertise their feeds so it, it really was a good match and of course in hindsight selling in the second inning of the fifth inning five inning game is probably not the yeah. Not the worst call. So that, that's a great, great outcome. <laughs> right. Um, how long did you work at Google for? You and Dick worked at Google? Um, two years. Um, so uh, from, from uh, June of 2007 to June of 2009. Um, and uh, it, it, was, uh, it, was, uh, it was a fantastic experience. It's, it, it is the... It is such a, it's, it's like the playground. And, and I'm, so I'm the, I'm the CTO, right? So I'm the tech guy. So it really was like a, like a playground. Uh, so why not stay? Well, it's... Uh, it's still a big company. I mean, it, it, it's, it's crazy innovative, a uh, great work environment, but I, uh, it just personally, I'm more of a, I'm just wired to be more of a startup guy. And so I wanted to, I wanted to do that again. So after this, um, was there a thought of burning door four? Well, there, there was, we, we, we did, uh, um, Dick and I did incorporate another company um, just, to, just to start the capital gains clock ticking. Uh, on that, uh, but uh, before we could actually get get to work on it, uh, then uh, he decided that he wanted to move out to California. And so, what made Dick move out to California? Uh, the weather. <laughs> Lauren. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Weather and wife; those are two. Yep. Yep. Um, those are those are the two best reasons. Yes, exactly. One best reason. Did you did reason. you did you guys think about moving out? No, no, we we never. Um, my, my 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 family is is is, is still here. Uh, my wife's family is is still here, uh, and and just the roots here, and, and I never, you know, don't want for any opportunities here in Chicago. I, I, I can't think of, of of what really that environment would offer that Chicago couldn't. Um, and so when Dick moved, that sort of broke the band up, and a little bit, yeah, yeah. Well, he he did that, and then and then quickly, uh, soon after he decided to do that, we were gonna we were gonna try to do the. You know, hey, we could we can work on this a, a little bit, kind of remotely, and, and, and think about that. Uh, but then he got the call from uh, from uh, Ev because uh, he was going to be going on on paternity leave, and for for Dick to move in as as a CEO position while he was uh, on leave uh, for Twitter, and and so we 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 talked uh, quite a bit about that. Um, he came out to he came out to Montana. We went to Montana for a little bit, and uh, and we talked about it, and and said, no, absolutely, this is the right decision uh, for for him to make. Well, that's a yeah, I, th I think it was. Turned out all right. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I think so. Um, so let's go back into Burning Door for a minute because you guys spend a lot of time on a theme we talk a lot about here at Founder Stories, which is product market fit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you, you tried a lot of different products. Um, talk about what are the best lessons, both things you do again or, and, and things you do wouldn't do, um, or both, um, mm -hmm. from the different uh, successes and, and uh, things that didn't work. As well, yeah. In for the burning door days, well, product market fit. Um, well, it's. I don't know if this if this directly directly answers your question. You can you can guide me back if I if I stray a little bit. But uh, part of uh, part of doing this is when in the early days of development, uh, when when you're really you're you're trying to define a product or even define a market if it didn't exist, is you really want to design your 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 product and your your kind of what you're building to give you kind of maximum flexibility down the line. Because you're just taking, you're just taking a guess, right? You're taking a guess that this is, this is the product that's going to satisfy some need that we think it is. Uh, and, and so build it with, with not, and there's this, there's this tension between, you know, MVP is build it as quickly as you can, get validation, iterate as, as quickly CTO's as you can. CTO's never like that, by the way, in my experience. Well, it's, it, no, it, there's, there's absolutely their value into that approach. And I, but I think it needs to be tempered with the idea of, okay, but, but come in with a, with a view towards, uh, you know, a view towards scale, a view towards how you're actually going to combine these things in different parts or, or redirect this light. So, is, so does, does that mean, you know, think of them as don't make a, build a big monolithic system, but build something that's more modularized? Or how do you think yeah. about building it flexible? Yeah. That, that, that's a, an excellent point, is, is like, think about, 
think about building the Lego blocks and, and snapping them together for this particular opportunity, mm. but then how as you get more requirements or feedback or validation or, or, or lack thereof, that you can, uh, how can you reconfigure the pieces? I like um, the system, I like the that. metaphor of uh, Lego blocks, that's interesting. Yeah. And, and, and you know, so yes, you could think about, hey, am I, am I building, you know, there might have been a lot of time to build the, the Death Star, right? Or you can spend time just designing really well done individual Lego blocks, well tested, ability to scale and things like that. And then you have a better chance of actually when you configure them of, of creating a scalable system. Yeah, it's funny, prototypes, we've done a couple of prototypes for different companies that have done over time and inevitably the prototype never fully disappears no matter what you That's do. right. It, it sort of it lives. In, the hacks remain. They do yeah. and you know, we're, we're just talking, our newest company is three and a half years old and. Uh, my VP of engineering looked at me and he said, I got to start paying off some of the code debt. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Uh, some of the new innovations we're going to hold out yep. because, and the problem is we built it too monolithically. Yeah. You know, prototyping was sort of like you, you weren't thinking that you have to make it extensible. And, um, and then code debt gets expensive. Yeah, and, and so there, there, is a, there is a tension between, you know, as, uh, just get the prototypes out as quickly as you can, you know, MVP with designing for the long haul. So I, I think there's a middle ground there. Yeah, um, and, and, and one thing that I, I like to, to, to tell um, my team is, you know, when we're thinking about this, even in the early days, kind of design for the wildest success you can imagine. Or at least keep in mind the wildest success <coughs> you can imagine, because that's why we're doing this, right? I mean, right. We're, we're, we're not in this to make little slight improvements, and in, in we're, we're in this to make a splash, right? So picture that. But how do you do that without, let me just, because I want to yeah. challenge it, because I think this is an interesting question. I, I get the first point completely. Yeah. I mean, you know, right now in the system, it takes an hour to do a build yeah. because we got to build everything. Yep. And we just, you know, when it was small, building everything was nothing. But yep. now that's an hour out of an engineer's time every time you go to deploy something. Yep. Yep. Um, but on the flip side, you know, if you build, if I said to our great engineers, hey, build something for our greatest success, yep. they would potentially build a platform that might take 5x as long to yeah. build, and we would only get 20% of the innovation. Well, and that's the, the and that's and that's the key is it's not don't I don't mean like build that now. I mean think about what that's going to look like, and don't make any decisions now in the early days that are going to cut off maybe one of those avenues. So, for example, designing so so both FeedBurner and 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 BrightTag are are these massively distributed systems, um, like lots of uh, across different data centers and all that kind of stuff. So, even then, day one. Don't design for a single web server. Don't do something like, sorry for to get tech, like don't design something like session affinity right off the bat. Always have two of everything. Like if you've got two of everything, then you can have a hundred of everything, right? Mm -hmm. But but design in that that uh, the fact that I'm going to have to do a load balancer and and uh, and flip off between these different things because so I'm going to have to figure do out that. principles that will be important to figure scale, out the but don't principles. Don't necessarily build it to scale. Exactly, and then and then and and so one of um one of the first the, the first hire that I did uh, at at FeedBurner um, is a um, guy named Joe Kaki, and he had the ability to so when when we need, when we hired him so he was our, our, our basically our IT ops guy to figure out how to scale this thing and when we hired him this fee burner was running on this this uh, sunbox behind a DSL line in our office and I was like looking at the terminal like watching the, the, the requests come in and so Joe's talent was to figure out okay we know that we need to move we need to grow up and actually put this in a data center and blah 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 all this kind of stuff but he knew the right steps to get there it's not like okay Great, so now, well this is, again, this is a big thing with Amazon, right? When, when you can provision clouds incrementally. Back then it was a huge capital expenditure. Like, all right, we gotta buy a cage, we gotta fill it with servers and buy all the bandwidth at, at a data well, center. Well, the other thing you get, scaling, how many of you are starting a company, working in a startup, or would like to work in a startup, is what we just said. So one of the interesting things that just came out that we talk a lot about, because our new company is all, our second company is all, um, largely all our new stuff is in the cloud is we built a pricing tool in a former company that mm -hmm. took us, I don't know, four months, five months to build. And now with solar in the cloud, there's a thing called cloud search at Amazon, mm -hmm. where we can literally build something, just JavaScript on the front end, yeah. and do in pro probably in two weeks build what took us four months. Yeah. Um, it's just an incredible, and it's built to scale. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that, that is absolutely the, the the biggest thing to change, you know, 
tech startup landscape in the last 10 years is the fact that we have cloud hosting now, that we have Amazon Web Services and things like that. And they're building these capabilities like the solar platform, yeah. the cloud search on top of it. Yep. Um, you know, you're getting things for free that we used to get, you know, a little module for free. Now we're getting a whole system for free. Well, free in the... Uh, well, I mean, from uh, the, from in the the fact, as long as you stay on their service, right? Yeah, right. So they, it's very sticky. No, it is. Yeah. It is. But, but in terms of like what it takes to build, I mean, yeah. the number of, you talk about your cost to build a product and to get it yep. out there and try it. Yeah. You it, know. Was, it, was, it was different in, in 2003, right? You had, to, you had to go install this, go down to the data center, uh, buy McCormick Place and install the servers and, uh, and get well, all that going. We still have a couple of those. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, all right, so let's talk about um, uh, Dick for a minute. Because Dick's now become a, a really um, well-known, well-respected. Larger than life. Larger, yeah. he is. He is. He's a, a Chicago founder who's done yep. done, uh, done great things. Um, talk a little bit about what's it. What was it like to work with Dick? And tell, give a sense people would know of Dick, yeah. but only as you know, a, 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 so maybe someone on the news. Yeah. Um, what? What? Talk about your experience with Dick. What was it like to found a company with Dick? What yeah. was it like to be? Um, partners in, in building something, what, what's he yeah. like and, and, and how has that played itself out into his career? Yeah, career? yeah, I mean, well, we, we basically worked together day in, day out for 15 years. So, um, you know, it was, uh, he, he was fantastic to work with. He just, uh, you know, absolutely authentic, genuine, funny, um, but with a very clear vision of, of, of product, both the product and how to do kind of the classic CEO things of, of how to talk to uh, investors and how to run a board meeting and, and things like that. So fantastic individual. He's, he is absolutely the right person. He's right where he should be right now at Twitter, and, and that's exactly who Twitter, Twitter needs right and now. And what are, what are Dick's greatest strengths? Like what are the things that you think <coughs> really make him the right guy for that job now? He does a really good job of gathering the information and then making a decision. No equivocating, no fence riding, uh, just, just kind of understanding and saying, you know what, the, given the information that we have, let's do this. And, and following through with that instead of, you know, waiting, waiting and, and, and seeing. He's also very, very personable, very easy to, to, to meet. And, and uh, you know, we had like one of those all-time stellar boards at FeedBurner. And, and to be able to, to, to meet with the board of directors and to be able to hang out with them. And, and a yeah, talk about who was on your board. This is a really interesting, yeah. if you follow So on the, on the FeedBurner board, we had uh, local luminary Matt McCall, uh, who, is, who is now at, at, at uh, Pritzker Ventures. Um, and he's, we've, we've known him for, for quite a while, even back in the Spy on It days. Uh, we had known Matt. So he's been uh, a huge supporter all the way along. So we had, we had Matt McCall. Uh, we had Brad Feld, um, who is now at, at Foundry Group out of Boulder. Uh, co-founder of TechStars. And co-founder of, of TechStars, exactly. He was on our board. Uh, we had uh, Fred Wilson uh, from Union Square Ventures out of, out of New York. Uh, and, 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 then, and, several, and then a few others that just, wow. you know, fantastic and, and great. And what, what's really interesting about that is both, both, both Brad and, uh, and Fred and Matt all became interested in FeedBurner because they were users of the product. Huh. Uh, they all had blogs. They were, you know, Fred is one of the most prolific bloggers. He's a great people. blogger. Oh, my I love goodness. this. I read it every day. Oh, my goodness. But but he he basically, he, he found us because he used us. What's, now, what's amazing about this is, take another step, is Fred was the first institutional investor, I think, in Twitter, wasn't he? Yep. And was on the board of Twitter for yep. a long time. And, yep. Um, it's... You get, your world is super, super, super small. Uh, that's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing that the feed burner world, I mean, it's, yeah. it's really remarkable, um, really remarkable. Um, so, and what a great, you know, story of all these people who have gone and do great things. Um, so one of the things you hear a lot when they talk about Dick Costello, um, and as a Chicagoan, you always want to see other Chicagoans do well and you root for the home team. We're, mm -hmm. you know, we're not a eat your own town, we're a support, mm -hmm. support people. I don't know Dick personally, but you want to see him do well. He's a Chicagoan doing well and uh, doing good things. But I've heard this debate a couple of times when they talk about product founders, sorry, product CEOs versus ops guys. And they're, mm. I won't say who said it, but they talk about it like it's an existential crisis in, uh, in Silicon Valley. And it, it, it's a little bit about, well, you know, you've got real product guys like Reed Hoffman, who is a great product guy. I don't think he came up the engineering path, but he's a great product guy. Yep. 
and a, and a terrific, terrific person. Um, and then they say, and then you get ops guys, you know, business guys, which is a little bit of a pejorative term. McKinsey for guys, or, you know, like come in and. And know. they use Dick as the example, mm. which I find interesting because um, Brad Feld in, in his book, Getting Things Done, talks about how Dick Costello gets up every morning thinking about the product and how he can make it better. And, yeah. um, I think Dick was an engineer at the University of Michigan. Yeah, computer science, uh, University of Michigan. Yeah. So, so talk about why you think that's misunderstood, and what is, and, and, and what would, as someone who really knows Dick probably as well professionally as anybody, um, what are people missing about Dick from the outside looking in, well, making that case? I, I, I think maybe there might be that perception because, um, you know, for, there, 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 because there was also the perception of. of a clear operational and management structure was the thing that was lacking, right? So if you're gonna do a diff between what was it like before Dick got there and afterwards, Twitter, the right. most visible change was the management team that he built, uh, the people that he brought in, uh, you know, um, Adam and Nathan and, and Ali and, and, and everything like that, to, to now that he's got this management team around him, uh, you, could, you could look at that, it's like, ah, see, he came in and, and he's all operations and, and now getting the, the train back on the track. Whereas, but really, he is, he is so involved in, in the product and the decisions. Uh, he's at, at every step of the way, uh, for every company that we did, certainly, uh, he was very involved in the product decisions. And I know for a fact that he's very involved in the product decisions at Twitter as well. Well, and I mean, it's non-trivial, but how many of you have used Twitter for a few years? Remember the fail whale? That fail whale was up there a lot. Yes, it was. Um, and uh, you know, products not just features; it's yep. it's reliability. I mean, when's the last time anybody saw the fail whale? I mean, it says the a lot. selfie, uh, selfie at L Ellen at the Oscar. <laughs> that was the last time. That was the last time we had one. Yeah, I mean, it's but it you know that's pretty uh, remarkable how um, there was a sense that Twitter might implode well, on its own platform. I mean, you talk about it, um, you talked about technical debt earlier and, and code debt that you had to do. There was essentially, a, you know, a nine-month feature development freeze at Twitter, where you didn't see a lot of new features because they were changing the jet engines on the on the plane while it was in flight, uh, which is a really tricky thing to do, given the given the infrastructure and the architecture that's behind it. To basically build a parallel architecture and then to be able to migrate onto that is is no small feat. So there was quite a bit of of, of finding the right group of people to actually tackle that problem. Do you think people appreciate? Um, out there that Dick's a founder and the things he's done, or do you think there's, there seems to be a big perception of him as like the hired gun executive, which seems the furthest thing from the yeah, truth. Yeah, I think, I think they spent, spent a couple seconds to actually uh, talk to him or, or actually research him again. I think they, they, they see that's not the case. Got it. Um, and talk just a little bit about um, how big was the speed burner when you sold it? There were uh, 30, 35 employees. All right, so this is an interesting question. So Dick was the pre CEO of Speedburner, mm -hmm. um, 35 employees. How many people work at Twitter, do you think? No, I don't know what the last number was, uh, but they, they just opened up a new floor, so it's, it's uh, north of 2,000 now. So that's a pretty big move to go from, I mean, to be such an effective CEO moving from 35 to 2,000. Yeah, well, I, I mean, but when he, when he joined Twitter, uh, it was it was still much less than a hundred. Really? Yeah, yeah. So even in in, in two thousand nine, uh, there was it was. So this really was the like first time he's managed so. scaling like that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And uh, any insights on what you think? Why, why do you think he was so well positioned for something to do so well at something he hadn't done before? I mean, I most know. most I, time I, you bring somebody in who's done it. I would love to, I would love to to to, to know because kind of uh, I'm you know, facing uh, at a much smaller level, but facing these kinds of uh, challenges at Bright Tag, where now we've got, uh, you know, a team of over 100. And, and for me, it's, it's like the biggest team that, that I've ever worked with, too. So I'm, I, I'll have to keep calling him and say, okay, what do you do now? What do you do now? Well, you're, you're a technical advisor at Twitter, aren't you? Yeah. So he can be your management advisor. And yeah. Well, thank God I have uh, Mike Sands as the CEO and to, to handle a lot of kind of stuff. I can, I can stay on the tech side of things. <laughs> that's, that's, and that's a huge part of it. And, and, and for anyone that I, I think, any, not to, to, to throw platitudes or advice, but anyone who, who's starting these things up is to find people that have complementary talents and can do the things that you're not good at or don't want to do. I, I mean, I, being a, a, a solo founder would, would just, I would not want to do that. <laughs> so talk a little bit about Bright Tag. What does Bright Tag do? Um, so Bright Tag is really a, 
uh, a way to, to manage. Uh, we, we, it's an enterprise software that we sell into large websites, um, basically, and it's a way to, for them to manage their, their, their data relationships. So who would be a classic kind of business? Oh, a lot of, a lot of uh, large, large retailers, so like a, like a uh, Macy's.com, Sears.com, uh, Zappos, things what, like that. What problem do you solve for them? Well, it's, it's basically a, a problem of how do I understand where my, where my customer is across different channels. Like I, I see them on my website, I see them on my mobile app, I maybe see them in a, in a physical store. How do I kind of connect those dots and, and have a cohesive view of, of my customer and work with my marketing partners to effectively kind of uh, understand uh, wh where, where to uh, spend my marketing dollars. Got it. And uh, I know you've had some great success. Anything you can share from a traction perspective? Well, it, it's, uh, it is great. So, so we're about, uh, we're a little over four years in now. Um, we're just over 100 employees. We're, we're just a couple blocks up, up here in, in, in River North. Uh, busting at the seams right now in our, in our office. So we're going to be looking for some, some new office space soon, hopefully, hopefully right around here. And uh, uh, huge, uh, just uh, enormous traction. So we're on uh, over, uh, we're working with over 10,000 clients wow. um, uh, around the world. Uh, a lot of that majority of our new client growth is actually in, in uh, Asia Pacific, uh, specifically Japan, because one of our, our, our largest partner and reseller is Yahoo Japan in Japan. So mm. uh, they essentially white label our solution as, as their thing. So they're a, a great way to acquire some clients. Interesting. Well, before we do our final questions, I want to go um, to the questions from the crowd here. Oh, you bet. Um, so what, what do you think is the most common mistake founders make early on? The most common mistake founders make early on? Yeah. Oh, that, that, hmm. Hmm. What do you think, Pat? <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing the interview here. Let me, let me here. tap dance a little bit and, and, and uh, try to think. Uh, well, let me like, ask you a question. You know, so there's a lot of talk about lean startup today. We've talked about, you mm -hmm, talked about minimum mm -hmm. viable product. Um, Certainly, you cited one, which is, hey, we, we got into this health imaging yeah. thing. We don't know anything about the domain. Yeah. You know, that, that certainly yeah. is one you see people who take a satellite photo view of an industry and say, oh, I, I know enough to go yeah. change this whole thing. Um, another well, is not understanding how to figure out product market fit. I mean, what, yeah, what are the ones that... that I, and so may, I might confine my, uh, I, I might narrow my answer a little bit potentially to, to, to web-based startups or, or, or even yeah, tech yeah. or software-based uh, startups, which is, you know, these days, if, if, you can't, if you can't actually validate your idea with, if, if not at the very least a prototype, but even a, maybe a little bit beyond that with, with, with some kind of working alpha that you can show and have people work uh, at before you raise funds, like to go into to try to raise funds from 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 angels or from from VCs or something like that with just a PowerPoint deck, um, I think is a is a mistake. Uh, mm -hmm. Especially if you're if if you, hey I've got this idea, all I need to do is find a couple technical co-founders and we're done, right? Um, the idea is something, the execution is the other thing, and you have to pay attention to both sides. There was a great Chris Dixon post on the idea maze and the idea that you know you're, it's not like the idea is everything. The idea is just a starting point to That's iterate right. and figure it out. Um, and you certainly learn a lot by putting um, something in front of people. Don Kitlos, the founder of Siri, our, well, we met, a mutual friend, uh, talked about his biggest advice was always do a, have a great demo. That's, that's, and Doug is that's a, huge. He, he has been, he's been big. Yeah, um, that's a good point. So another question about analytics. Mm -hmm. um, seeing is there, how there is such, all caps, an incredible client demand for tracking measurement of KPIs most close to digital strategy, what major trends, i.e. software usage, are game changers? Well, um, you know, I, I think the, the, the biggest shift uh, related to analytics over the past, uh, again, let's call it seven or eight years, has been um, more like the Google Analytics model, where anyone can just go ahead and I'm going to instrument my site with Google Analytics and use their tool set to, to understand. And then if you get really good at it, you can t ask all sorts of questions. Mm -hmm. In the enterprise software world and, and kind of large e-commerce websites, the uh, Adobe Omniture is, is kind of the tool that, that rules. It's, it's, a, it's a beast to, to set up and configure, but the, the depth of analytics that, that you can get out of that that are appropriate to, to retailers specifically is, is kind of unmatched. So 
I think the, the idea of, of being able to, to understand it and manage those effectively over time, I think the biggest change going forward is going to be, that's great, I really understand uh, my customer's journey through my website, uh, but increasingly the customer is going to be uh, interacting with you across different channels. Mm -hmm. And how can I tie that together? How can I tie together their mobile usage with my web usage, with other things that I, I know about my customers? Well, let me ask a question on the retailer thing. Um, I'm always surprised by, um, in 2014, that the retail experience in 2014 and the retail experience online in 2004 aren't as dramatically different as so many other things in technology mm -hmm. have come. Why do you think the, the retail, I mean, there's a lot of efficiency. We've done a great job of the utilitarian model, yeah. you know, Amazoning the world, yeah. make it hyper efficient. But, you know, you talk to people about buying something and they, you know, they end up having to talk to other human beings, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, I, I get an example the other day, was somebody was that we were talking about, my, I'd throw out my waffle iron and I tried to find one because everything's stuck to it. My kids would yeah. make waffles and the you know, things stuck all over the place and I'm trying to find one that doesn't stick. Yeah. And to do that, I had to read all the reviews and say, you know, it was really, yeah. it was a shockingly hard thing no matter what site I went to. Yeah. And you talk to consumers and they talk, still talk about, they talk to people. Why do you think the with your big retail customers you have, you know, you learn a lot about them. They have big sites, but why do you think the experience has been more business model, -y, like well, Amazon or Gilt, you know, and less kind of the interactivity of? Well, this is the. I mean, this is the this is the nut that that Facebook and Twitter are trying to crack, right? This is, I think, solving that problem is to some extent built into their current valuations. Mm -hmm. This idea that sometime we're going to figure out this this social recommendation and buying thing and be able to get in that that monetary stream and to be able to do that. So I think to date, haven't figured that out yet. Haven't figured out that formula. But there's uh, I think some confidence built into the current stock price that that eventually one or more of these companies is going to figure that out. So for a guy who got into imaging in Princeton in the early 90s, um, why am I still looking at a photograph of a, of a shirt and I can change the color a little bit and spin it around, but why is it, why have those experiences not evolved? We have Oculus just having, so all these interesting things happening. You're not wearing, wearing your phones. Oculus, that's the problem. You <laughs> exactly. Gotta, you gotta be walking Oculus around with shopping. your Oculus, <laughs> then you'll be fine, you know. Okay. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that retailing online is still much more utilitarian relative to some of the innovations we've seen in other areas? I, I, that, that, uh, good question. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure. I think given the, well, given the amount of uh, dollars and time that, that my wife and I actually spend on, on Amazon uh, for, for products and things, I mean, that's had a, I think there's there's something to be said for for just nailing the process down and the efficiency so you don't even think about it. So it may be utilitarian, but it's also crazy no, efficient. It's, it's fantastic. I think we've nailed the utilitarian side of it. The question always to me is, if you don't know what you want, that works great when mm. you know what you want. Yeah. Or you're pretty close, you just look to the top recommended. Yeah. But any kind of purchase that involves consideration mm -hmm. or requires me to think about is this really no stick? Yeah. You know, because yeah. if I buy another one, I got to throw it out and go crazy. Um, it's surprising. You know, you right. could go into the, just drive over to a Williams Sonoma and, and like look at it, touch it, and all that kind of stuff. But who would do that, right? You got to hop into a car. I need a, I need, you know, I left that my Amazon price check there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. A couple more questions and then we'll wrap up. Uh, how do you show causality between social metrics and business goals? I don't know why. Well, I, 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 I don't have much much personal experience with this, so we could uh, this okay. could be something that we we could try to figure out together. Um. Well, I know nothing about this, so I won't even venture again. Yeah. Um, All right. Yeah. Good. Um, good. Good question. Let me let, let me let me know if you think of that. He'll email you back. Um, what do you think about the speculation about Twitter acquiring SoundCloud, and do you think it would have a positive outcome if it happened? Well, you know, they've made a few runs at. Uh, at, at different domains in in, uh, in video with Vine, um, in thinking about uh, in thinking about the photo space and in music, like there was uh, you know uh, uh, I ping for a while they'd work with with uh, Apple that did, that didn't go so well. So I think there is there is some natural affinity to think about what is uh, you know Twitter aspires to be we're the we're the caption for the internet right mm -hmm. we're the 
or the, the, the caption for the real life experiences, what's going on uh, now. And a big part of that, you know, you see with the rise of, of, of Spotify and, and social recommendations for that kind of music. I think there is the, this idea that, that we can, this is, this is a rich media landscape to actually plow and, and to figure out. This is one of these things that people will listen to recommendations. And so to weave that into your social graph uh, at, at Twitter, uh, I, I have no, no inside knowledge of, of, of what's going on or, or the ideas behind that, what may be the decision, but it seems to make sense from an outsider's perspective. Got it. And then uh, one last question here, we'll let us the final question of the night is, um, a question that came in a couple minutes ago was about uh, when you at Bright Tag have been acquiring customers, how many of those were kind of cold calls with an idea versus people who heard about you or you got some other kind of tailwind? Yeah. Um, you know, starting out, a lot of it is, hey, let's look at let's look at the internet retailer top 100 or something like that, and let's just start making calls. It was dialing for dollars, really. And how hard was it early on? Did it well, they got to right away, or was it? It actually was. Uh, um, we were lucky enough to get. Uh, we kind of went whale hunting early and, and landed a few really, uh, really good ones, which is actually really good for our particular business uh, because we have a two-sided equation between the 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 retailers and the sites that use our tool, and the uh, the vendors that are actually consuming the data uh, from those sites. And so to be able to have uh, the, the brands and the retailers be able to exert some pressure on those vendors to work with us so we can effectively distribute that data was a big win early on. Got it. And then the final question I ask everybody is, uh, what are your thoughts today on Chicago for entrepreneurs founding digital startups? How do you think this is? <laughs> Obviously, you just founded another company here, uh, been a part of doing this a couple of times, but what are your thoughts on the relative advantages and disadvantages and how it is now versus other places and historically? Yeah, I, I am, you know, that, that is a, a popular topic of discussion uh, around here. And, and I just don't see, uh, I don't see what the, the, the disadvantage is. We, we don't have a disadvantage. We have the same. Uh, you know the same abilities, the same the same talent pool, the same ability to start, the same, uh, especially in an early stage, access to capital. Uh, now a vibrant community, kind of with with 1871, I would say as the nucleus. Uh, I mean, I think it's improved dramatically over the past four years or five years, uh, and especially in the last uh, year and a half or, or was it a year and a half? 1871. Two yeah. years. This two month? years ago. Two years ago. This is our 18th founder story. Yeah. Yeah. So so so. To have this now, I, whenever I am out at at Botrus or something like that, and I'm overhearing conversations, it's it's about technology, it's about startups, it's about those kinds of things, which which you know didn't happen before. So, I, I don't look at it as like, oh, what do we have to overcome? What do we have to do to be the next this or that? It's mm -hmm. it's like we, we have there. There's no reason that you can't start a, a successful startup. I heard Chris Dixon made an interesting point. He talked about uh, the Valley is <clears throat> typically an infrastructure place where a lot of the companies were infrastructure sort of driven. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but the city of San Francisco, a place like Twitter, is more of an application city. Mm. You know, Chicago, with some exceptions, it very much seems like an application city at a lot of levels. Yeah. There's a lot of great companies. I mean, if just from our founder story setup, we have Grubhub's now public at $2.5 billion valuation. Field Glass sold for over a billion dollars. Yep. Uh, Braintree, Braintree sold for almost a billion dollars. Yep. Big machine sold for almost five hundred million dollars, almost yep. a half a billion dollars. I yep. mean, that's just from our lineup here. Those are just people who have liquidity events. Yep. Um, you know, it certainly doesn't seem to be holding anybody back. But. No, no. I mean, and you could you could try to to draw analogies of our, our traditional strengths as a city and 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 where we've been in the past. And and certainly we could we could use that you know with our uh, you know around the Merck and the uh, financial um, expertise that we have and. And biomedical, Argon as a as a as a thing, consulting companies and and all that kind of any one of those you could say ah so therefore Chicago is is going to be strong in that. But you know, I firmly believe this day you can those kinds of labels are just not as important if, if you have an idea and you want to pursue it. Great. Well, thanks so much. It was great. Really it was appreciate. My pleasure. Thank thanks. you. Thank you very much. <laughs>